Hey, it's Lou, and some wild shit is going down in India, where fear-mongering spread on WhatsApp has been linked to horrific violence. Unsubstantiated rumors that child kidnappers are on the prowl have incited at least two dozen lynchings. Other disinformation touches on all aspects of Indian life, but a recurring theme is don't trust outsiders. This us versus them mentality inflames existing divisions in Indian society, whether that be the urban rural divide, the caste system, or a rising tide of Islamophobia. Critics say this plays into the Hindu nationalist agenda of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. By using religious and class resentments, he's able to consolidate power. But conspiracy theories on platforms like WhatsApp isn't a problem unique to India. In countries across the world, viral fake news has inspired real terror. The question is, are tech companies to blame? Or are there darker cultural trends at play? Technology is spreading fast in India, particularly smartphones. In recent years, the price of data has plummeted. New digital infrastructure has improved service. Meanwhile, the Indian economy continues to grow, so more and more folks can afford connected lives. WhatsApp, the Facebook-owned messaging service, is particularly popular in the country. Essentially a replacement for text messaging, it's free, it's easy to use, and it's not data intensive. No wonder, then, that there are 250 million Indian users who send an estimated 13.7 billion messages a day. Traffic is particularly high between sunrise and 8 a.m. when a new cultural phenomenon is on display, the exchange of cheerful good morning messages and photos. Unfortunately, not all communication on WhatsApp is so innocuous. Jensi Jacob, the managing editor of Boom, an Indian fact-checking organization, told me disinformation on a range of topics, from public health scares to food production, have permeated the platform. In Kanur, India, anti-vax rumors have prevented hundreds of thousands of children from getting an essential vaccination. Meanwhile, many poultry sellers went out of business after a hoax about a chicken virus went viral and destroyed sales. Then there are the child abduction rumors. One widely shared video on WhatsApp showed a boy being snatched off the street, but some important context was missing. The video was part of a fictionalized public service announcement produced in Pakistan. Nonetheless, it stoked fear and contributed to at least two dozen lynchings between April and July this year. The problem got so bad that the Indian government dispatched rumor busters carrying megaphones with the aim of debunking all this hysteria. But in a terrible incident of irony, one of those rumor busters was accused of spreading fake news. He was beaten to death with sticks and bricks. Jensi told me the child abduction rumors connect to a pre-existing fear of human trafficking, which is a real issue in certain regions. Trust in police is also very low, so many Indians feel they have to take justice into their own hands. Santa Clara University professor Rohit Chopra, an expert on India's media culture and the rise of Hindu nationalism, told me the disinformation also exploits a fear of outsiders, like strangers from another village. No wonder, then, that many of the lynching victims war outsiders passing through a community. One group of victims had stopped to ask for directions. Chopra added that the insider-outsider narrative is often deployed to target Muslims in particular. One common viral trope is that Muslims are stealing and slaughtering cows, a sacred animal in much of India. In 2018 alone, there have been 21 hate crimes and 10 deaths related to cow violence. This us versus the narrative, according to the experts I spoke to, is linked to the rise of right-wing Hindu nationalism, a position espoused by Prime Minister Modi. For centuries, Chopra explained, Hindus and Muslims were able to coexist. By and large, the communities integrated peacefully. However, the Hindu nationalist movement created a cleave in recent decades. Citizens were encouraged to take sides. Basically, by othering segments of the population, Modi and like-minded allies forced the Hindu majority to double down on their religious identity. Are you with us or are you with them? Jensi pointed out that this dynamic is often found in countries where nationalism is on the rise. Chopra added that many of the false rumors were likely started by Modi's allies and members of his political party, the BJP. There's evidence to support this widely held suspicion. For instance, a spokesperson for BJP shared a video in which a Muslim politician is speaking. The translation in the video asserts that the Muslim politician pledges unending bloodshed of Hindus. But according to an Indian fact-checking organization, that's not at all what he said. Instead, he predicted that he'd do such a good job if elected, he'd be in the Guinness Book of World Records. 
Interesting discrepancy there. This isn't a unique occurrence, by the way. The BJP has been called out by fact checkers time and again for spreading lies. The party actually pioneered the use of social media in Indian politics, using it to fuel Modi's 2014 election. That sort of opened up a Pandora's box. In recent local elections, some WhatsApp users complained of receiving over a thousand political messages a day. A BBC study found that many Indians feel compelled to pass along these messages out of Hindu power. They feel duty bound to share nationalist rhetoric. Gen Z told me that it's difficult to sort out what is true and what is false when there's that much of a deluge. Instead, people can cherry pick what they want to believe. Chopra referred to this paradigm, which we certainly see in the US as a validation economy. Professor Kalyan Chada, a media scholar at the University of Maryland, told me that messages on WhatsApp in particular are more likely to be trusted than ones on other platforms because WhatsApp feels more personal. It's messages directly from loved ones and acquaintances or groups that you trust, so you don't bother evaluating them with a critical eye. Chada added that while technology adoption has spread in India, tech and media literacy have not necessarily kept a pace. That is, many people, particularly in rural areas, aren't used to deciphering what is real and what is just straight up propaganda. This certainly isn't unique to India. A study out of MIT found that false news was 70% more likely to be retweeted than the truth. A separate study concluded that approximately one in four Americans visited a fake news site in the weeks immediately before and after the 2016 presidential election. And the computational propaganda project at Oxford University revealed that WhatsApp was the main platform for disinformation in seven out of 10 countries that had disinformation campaigns. Which begs the question, is there something unique about WhatsApp that allows dangerous bullshit to flourish? Perhaps. The founders of WhatsApp were hell-bent on privacy, so end-to-end -end encryption makes it a black hole. It's nearly impossible to monitor. There are no gatekeepers that might prevent the dissemination of dangerous rumors. No easy way to see where the hoaxes start or the path they take. In a weird way, this is similar to how gossip spreads between friends in secret, but somehow everywhere at once. For what it's worth, Modi's government has pointed an accusatory finger at the platform, asserting that WhatsApp cannot evade accountability and responsibility. This feels a bit self-serving, if not hypocritical, given his party's fake news history I just discussed. Meanwhile, a WhatsApp spokesperson told me, quote, we are horrified by the mob violence and murders that happened in India earlier this year. We believe this is a challenge that requires government, civil society, and technology companies to work together. The spokesperson pointed me to a number of actions the company took in the last few months to ensure safety, including limiting the number of groups a message can be forwarded to and identifying when something is a forward and not an original message from the sender you know and trust. They've even rolled out an ad campaign, Share Joy, Not Rumors. WhatsApp should be given some credit for making these changes, but they should also be chastised for failing to imagine that something like this might happen in the first place. Chada told me that tech companies always emphasize positive rhetoric when they introduce a new product, but they need to be cognizant that all types of participation is going to pour in to their platforms, including harmful stuff by bad actors. It's inevitable and they need to be prepared for it. Chopra added that tech companies often fail to understand that every country has a unique set of issues, a certain historical context. So tech products shouldn't be seen as one size fits all. They should be redesigned for each market. That's going to be particularly important going forward as internet penetration grows in developing countries. And that's certainly a good thing. As more and more cultures come online and get connected to the digital world, that will create new business opportunities, new ways to connect. Technology often eases burdens. But the move fast and break things Silicon Valley ethos is really dangerous when societies are the things that could be broken. Yet, in the case of India, both Chopra and Chada agree that WhatsApp is a scapegoat. Gen Z told me the lynchings and disinformation are cultural problems, not a platform problem. The root causes, like a rise in Hindu nationalism, like religious tensions, like a citizenry that doesn't trust the police department, those have to be addressed offline, in real life. Because where there are human problems, we need human solutions.